Real pleased to be up here and lead the discussion about the future of energy in Kern County. As all of you know, energy in Kern County is something that has driven the economy of Kern County for a long time. <coughs> Agriculture and energy, particularly oil and gas production, has been important. I think one thing you'll, you'll learn is, just like our nation, I think Kern County has taken the role of an all of the above strategy. The one that I think no one's picking up is nuclear, but I personally believe nuclear would be an important part of the all above energy strategy. But uh, it'll be great to talk about what some of the oldest um, renewables, geothermal and wind, um, when we get talking about it. Uh, I think actually geothermal, because I've looked into this, has more regulatory issues than probably even oil and gas business um, when you think about reg uh, regulatory issues and when you talk about oil and gas. So I think they deal, Don probably deals with more issues than anyone else. Um, I think it's really important to think about because our, our industry, the energy industry here in Kern County provides valuable jobs that enable the middle class really lifestyle to occur. You know, good industrial type jobs. So when we talk about this, we're gonna talk about some questions and ponder what's going on in Kern County. We're permitting a ton of solar. We're doing a lot of wind. We're, we're, we did the Kern County EIR to facilitate oil and gas. You know, in, the, in a state that, you know, is pretty anti-industrial, uh, work unless you want to build a brand new football stadium you know it's pretty hard to get things permitted um, so I mean even when Tesla has to go to Nevada to build their battery factory you know it tells you how hard it is to permit things to get jobs done in the state so I think it's really critical when you think about industrial jobs and good middle-class jobs for people with high school diplomas and not college degrees it's really important to think about um, energy industry here and what we've done in Kern County over the decades that, are, that it's been here, arguably 100 years. Uh, so when I think about this, we look at what's going on in California. We have the highest poverty rate. We have some of the highest energy prices in the nation. And only about a third of our graduates have bachelor's degrees. What, what do you guys think is the pathway to continue the middle class growing here in Kern County? And I'll start with Suzanne since she went to high school with me at BHS. Um. <laughs> I knew you were going to make this hard on me, Tom. <laughs> <sighs> well, regarding the poverty rate, I, I think the oil and gas industry in California, um, we do give people. Can you hear me all right? Okay. We do give people um, across the educational spectrum. Uh, in particular, the, the working class, uh, the avenue to the middle class. And I have a whole bunch of WISPA fact sheets up here, so if you want to go to our uh, website and see any of these statistics, but I brought a few statistics with me. But I mean, just under 40% of the workers in our industry actually only have a high school degree or less, and 30% have maybe an associate's degree. And what's most astounding about this is most of these jobs, about 20%, or I'm sorry, most of these jobs have more than a 20% higher income than the average in California. So I think our industry provides those type of jobs, especially here in Kern County, that, that can help those who maybe didn't have the opportunity to go to college and still want to be in the economic middle class of our communities in our state. Thanks. Uh, Bill, what do you think from a government's perspective? What's uh, your role? And I mean, obviously, you have a background in our industry. What, what's your, what do you think the role is to facilitate you know, the, this kind of opportunity set to develop a growing middle class? Yeah, th thanks, Simon. Th thanks, thanks for allowing me to be here. It's a real honor. So um, as Todd has articulated, as, as Susan, the, the oil and gas industry is a very broad spectrum uh, employment opportunity space, right? It ranges from you know, high-end PhDs uh, doing high-performance computing and, and geophysical modeling, earth modeling, down, down to or including the uh, oil field workers um, who can make a great living um, getting the oil out of the ground. So you can extend that, that perspective on to kind of the accessory uh, opportunities, which is, for instance, my organization. So we, we employ uh, the same kind of spectrum of people, geologists, engineers, uh, oil field experienced workers, field engineers, uh, clerical, uh, IT people. So it's, uh, it's, you can think about kind of the follow-on effects of, of generating, a, uh, producing a barrel of oil out of the ground in terms of its economic impact. 
in all the accessory occupations that come with the, the consulting agencies. Um, you know, we're in the permitting agency in the aqua for exemption or business. And in all of those, uh, we meet with lots of different kinds of people, consultants, operators, um, people that are interested in, in, in all aspects of this. And so what we see is, is a very rich uh, employment space, uh, which, which captures a variety, an incredible variety of different kinds of, of skill sets and experience. So I mean, from my perspective, uh, we, as, as an agency, you know, we, uh, our, our role is, is, to, is to work with the, with the companies to make sure that, um, that the production is done according to certain standards that the state has, has applied. But I think it's really, it's really encouraging to see, again, this spectrum of employment opportunities and the people that we meet every day um, that across the board uh, generating income and buying T-shirts and lattes at Starbucks every day. It's just a really neat thing. And Don, what, what's, your, what's your take? The way I think we get to uh, improving the economy is really through the development of infrastructure. Uh, basic infrastructure, and Richard mentioned it earlier, the Tehachapi Renewables Transmission Project. That project drove a lot uh, of the wind and solar development and renewable energy development into Kern County. Over 11,000 megawatts of energy being developed in Kern County. Would that have been developed without the Tehachapi Renewable Transmission Project? That's a great question. Uh, but it was developed. And all the jobs, both in construction and then subsequent operations, and then the ancillary jobs that build off of that. Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, WWS located in Tehachapi. Um, I remember speaking with Daryl Ragsdale back in 2013, and they had 15 people in their company. And he asked me, what do you need? The well said, the tumbleweeds in Antelope Valley are killing us. I need some help. And now they have over 250 people, a large private employer in Kern County, and they have expanded into maintenance operations, light construction operations, service industries. and. That employing, uh, you know, local uh, Kern County citizens, uh, it, that wouldn't have happened without uh, the attached renewable transmission project. And so the ability to provide those local jobs and provide good, uh, safe working jobs uh, for people who are real, real excited. And, uh, you know, I think WWS is a success story of, you know, a small business taking an initiative you know, growing, talk about incubation of businesses, you know, a small business willing to say, yes, yes, we'll do that for you. Yes, we can do that. Uh, it's really helped uh, help them. And, you know, I think it's a great success story. So from what I, what I hear from folks, because obviously Kern County is currently the number three producing oil and gas county in the lower 48. And a few years ago was actually number one. It's slipped a little bit. But I think we've been an incredible uh, economic driver by renewables, putting in wind power and uh, solar power. Is the permitting in Kern County easier for you guys uh, when you, I mean, I know from our sector how, how it is, but how is it um, relative to wanting to do something in LA County or you know, somewhere else in the state? I would say Mr. Murphy said it the, the best in what Kern County is not. Um, it's really uh, nice to be able to pick up the phone and get an answer get a decision. Um, I don't think it's any any easier. Um, there, obviously, Kern County is really good at following it, at all applicable regulations and laws uh, that are required. But the ability to pick up the phone and get an answer, the ability, the quickness that they turn around plans and permits, and the ability to work with you and to accept, as uh, Mr. Murphy said, the phone call. I've made that call uh, to Mr. Murphy a time or two. And so that is a, a real asset to the county to be able to have that discussion. And so when we think about developing renewable energy five, ten years ago, there were no codes for it. It was brand new. You had a couple wind turbines, but you're talking about uh, you know some of these large solar projects that cover thousands of acres with technology that was you know straight off the shelf, you know, first of its kind. How do you permit that when there is no code? How do you permit that when there is no precedent? And the imagination, innovation, and the discussion that you can have uh, from county government is is fantastic and amazing. And then the vision, you know, the, uh, the supervisors, uh, Kern County supervisors, and the planning departments is absolutely amazing to say, you know, we're going to have 10,000 megawatts of renewable energy in 2011. I, I mean, that's that is an amazing vision, and they've exceeded it. So it's a truly remarkable, that type of vision and planning and the ability to execute on that is, uh, really makes uh, you know, doing business in Kern County really fun. 
Yeah, that kind of leads me into what uh, one of my personal pet peeves is how much of our energy in California is imported from foreign sources and from other states. Because in my mind, you know, I, I have a, also a background as an army officer, you know, the security issues dealing with foreign energy sources, then effectively you're exporting jobs elsewhere. I mean, to give you some context, over 90% of our natural gas is imported. Over two thirds of our oil is imported from foreign sources. Only about 11% of that's from Alaska. And 32% of electricity. So in effect, we're incentivizing job creation in other parts of the world and other states. You know, the actual amount of electricity that's imported is getting, is improved, is going up. That's why it's uh, nice to hear Kern County has been facilitating, you know, electrical generation here in the state. But I think it's frustrating when you look at that. I mean, what can the, from your perspective, I think I know, I know my perspective is that, you know, better permitting, more predictable permitting, no matter what you're doing, because again, it's an all the above energy strategy for us to be more um, self-sufficient as a, as a state and a country. What, what, what would you want to do if you were kind of king or queen for a day, um, you know, to help facilitate so that we don't have to depend on, you know, electricity generation in Wyoming or other places um, and, and uh, crude from the Middle East or, you know, those kind of things. So, I mean, I'll start with you, Don, and work our way back. Sure. I, I'll go back to my original one was, is infrastructure. Uh, the development of infrastructure can help drive the development of energy and the development of businesses, whether it's transmission lines, roads, pipelines. Uh, then the second part of that is developing, you know, the critical infrastructure is to help uh, drive smart grids. And, uh, you know, that goes down to the education and to make sure you have the technical jobs that can drive in these substations to improve the smart grid. If you think about, uh, looked it up, it's public knowledge, but so far this year, uh, 358,000 megawatt hours of renewable energy have been curtailed due to congestion. So if you think about, you ask the question of, well, how can we become more energy independent? Let's, you know, California creates a lot of renewable energy. It's only going to grow as with the duck curve uh, graph that was shown earlier with the deployment of rooftop solar and, you know, continual renewable energy being brought online. The ability to move and transmit uh, that renewable energy that is available to you because that uh, 358,000 megawatt hours is only going to grow. It's only going to grow. So the transmission lines, smart grids to be able to put the energy where it's needed the most can really help push the energy uh, independence because if you talk about the energy importing, uh, imagine if Kern County wasn't producing 11,000 megawatt hours of renewable energy. That number would be even more. So you think more energy infrastructure in Kern County could turn it more into even a hub? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a hub, I know, for natural gas going north or south into PG&E and SoCal. SoCal. So when you think about it, it can become a hub if they do the kind of infrastructure spending to wheel electricity around the state. Absolutely. It's, a, it's in a great geographic location. A couple hours to the north, you're in the Bay Area. A couple hours to the south, you're in uh, you're in L.A. area, you know, even access to San Diego. And then, it, it, you know, again, a couple hours to the, to the east, we start getting into Nevada and Las Vegas. So you can even become a net energy exporter, you know, at some point, which can then drive, you know, economic growth to export to uh, Las Vegas at some point. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you. It's, it's actually a really interesting and important question, and um, we, we talk about it a lot. And there's, there's some statistics in, um, that I'll share with you, um, actually published by a friend of mine named Mark Mills. And, and one of them is that we're actually in one of the great, as a second great energy consumption revolutions, and the first was transportation. And, and the next one are these things, right? So your 4G phone consumes 60 times more energy in the grid than your 3G phone did. So this is turning into a major step function in, in energy demand and consumption, which is a really unprecedented since, since the onset of, of transportation fuels. So it's an important question to ask, where, where are we going to get, this, where are we gonna get this, uh, this energy, especially electricity, which these things all run off of. Another statistic that kind of underscores this, uh, this change um, is that the, the number of transistors that are manufactured every year today exceeds the number of grains of wheat that are harvested. And these are all going into data centers, right? So these Walmart-sized data centers, of four, you know, there's 400 plus of them in the U.S. today, and uh, they're all powering these things. It's all about, about big data analytics, the Google, Google data centers, the Amazon data centers, these big cloud computing centers, and more and more of what we do every day is moving into that environment. So it's, it's a really important question, right? Where where are these electrons going to come from? How are we going to transport them around the state? 
So, well, and the reliability of the grid. I think California has the worst reliability. It has more than twice as many outages as the next grid, which is Texas. So it goes back to Don's point on infrastructure. Maybe we need to do a better job of that and getting the reliability factor up. And, you know, and, and it's the complement of, you know, whether it be renewables in the midday or natural gas or however you're going to use to fire things to keep things level loaded so people can power their phones and everything else, right? Yes, and, and, don't, and don't forget, there's a, there's a, there's a, a stated uh, intention by, by the governor, by the state, to increase the number of electric cars on the road uh, in the next 20 years. So as we're all plugging in our electric cars, you know, we either need more power plants or more walls, one of the two, right, where the energy, energy comes from. But it, it all comes down to the infrastructure. Where does the energy come from? How do you store it? How do you move it? So from, from our perspective at, at, at Dogger, and I want to I build on what, what was previously mentioned here about, about uh, permitting efficiency. So I, I've just passed my, my second anniversary at, at Dogger. And what we've tried to do in the last couple of years is, is improve our, our ability as, as regulators in a couple of dimensions. And one is, is organizational efficiency. So that when the phone, phone rings, that we, we can quickly come, come to an answer and deliver, and deliver a permit, deliver an answer, deliver instructions or questions, whatever it needs to be, so that we can try to streamline that process as, as, as good as we can. And the other important thing uh, that we were trying to accomplish, this is all part of the renewal plan that was published by Steve Bullen and David Bunn two years ago, is to really increase our, our technical prowess, right? So what we've done to do that is increased our staff considerably. Uh, we've brought in a lot of people from, from industry with a lot of great experience, both in how oil fields operate and especially in how to operate technologies. Uh, we were, uh, have, have brought in new technologies in the organization, and even to the extent we, month, last month, were uh, awarded two awards for innovation by, by Oracle uh, as a result of our, our big data analytics uh, um, uh, implementation that we've done to try to take a look at the 100 years of, of data uh, for in, in California oil fields with the intention of, of being able to execute those other two important objectives, which is, which is streamlining and shortening the time cycles on these things, but also importantly, to come to much better answers so that in our communications with, with operators as we're, as we're working with you to work on the, the, the 60,000 uh, active oil wells are in Kern County, 78% of the active wells in California are right here in Kern County. How do we work to, to make sure that this, this, this industry is maintained, but we also are respecting the, the laws that, that, that uh, govern how, how, that, um, how that energy is extracted from the ground? So but those are the big things that we're trying to do. But I, I think the question of where does the energy come from, that we, most of all the imports come from Saudi Arabia. There's been discussions about, uh, at least in conversations I had, about you know, what are the human rights records of these countries are getting these from, where the environmental records of these countries are getting things from. I had a, a conversation with the governor last week about this because he's his, you know, he gets tarred and feathered by the extreme left of his party because he supports native production, but he's like, oh, why do I want to export jobs to countries that don't have good environmental records, that don't have the human rights records, you know, and then I have to transport across the ocean to get it here. And it's not, you know, he understands it's not just a transportation fuel. It's also a, used in so many products that make our lives, you know, including a phone you held up today, uh, uh, possible. So I think it's important, you know, government to understand that um, going forward. Suzanne. Um, Todd, you mentioned, you know, what's the role or responsibility of government in regards to the dependency on energy uh, imports. and. I want to focus a little bit more on that. I mean, the structure of our, of our especially our state legislature, um, it, it tends to lead itself on the highest and the most strictest standards for businesses in this state. And one thing that I think is important is that our representatives need to be patient and let the regulatory agencies uh, do their job. I find that a lot of the um, representatives pass laws and they also want to see about implementing those laws and a lot of times they don't have the expertise that they need to implement them appropriately. Um, that's a hindrance on business. It's also very costly uh, where you have the regulatory agencies that, that know what they're doing and uh, they do it appropriately and in a timely manner. Um, I also think it's we have to be cautious that we don't put policies in place that not only hinder but limit uh, our availability to all energy um, opportunities uh, in, in, our, in our state and in our country. And I think that also legislators need to think long term 
as opposed to the immediate day-to-day -day effects or what they read in the media. But I think, I think they need to take the responsibility and make sure that they are looking out for your energy supply from, from all avenues. And, and let's face it, 92% of the transportation fuels in, in, in California come, are petroleum-based. And although there's plenty of space and room for alternative energies, it's going to take some time before that percentage is going to change dramatically. So we need to really be realistic about where we are and, and what we're doing in the state, not only from a day-to-day -day basis, but for, from more of a long-term perspective. And I think the government needs to take a, a, a more, more responsibility in that role. No, I think I would tend to agree. I, I think the, the biggest problem we have is everything is, every topic in every industry has become so politicized. You know, our industry, pharma, banking, everything's become so politicized, so you can't have an open, honest discussion like we're having today saying, you know, I think we all believe in all of the above makes sense, and we're, we're interested in energy security and the like. But the narrative that goes on, particularly in this state, it's so different when you travel around the country and talk to different people, because the narrative here gets hijacked really by a uh, media and NGOs effectively who are, you know, anti the oil and gas industry and, um, and pro, and they're not even sure what they're pro, but they're for, I think, solar power. The, if, if they knew all the, ne some of the stuff was geothermal, they might not like geothermal. But, um, but it's sort of interesting that, you know, they, they very play fast and loose with the facts and no one's had an honest discussion about you know, where does the rare earth minerals come from? Where does the lithium come from? All the mining, all the issues associated with supply chain associated with all their hopes and aspirations. And in the meantime, everyone wants their, you know, power to be on when they, when they go to turn on their power and charge their phone. So what can we do in private sector and in the, and in the government sector to help change this narrative so we have a, a kind of an honest discussion about what's possible and probable. I mean, you had the thing down in Oxnard with the, the natural gas power plant and, 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 and just, you know, the loud, loud, most people shouting in the room seem to uh, basically be able to shout it down with the California Energy Commission. But if you talk to people who work on the grid behind the scenes and are afraid to speak publicly, they'll tell you, we really need to have this for reliability purposes. But uh, again, I, how can we change that in our, you know, in our public and private sector. And I'll let you go ahead and start, Suzanne, work our way back. Well, I don't, I don't have the answer on how we change it, but I'll, I'll say that stability is very important for all of us. Um, we also need, in going forward, in order to achieve our, our goals and our needs, um, again, I, I think from a long-term perspective, we need to be more pragmatic about how we measure and how we approach the development of our energy policies, and I think that's key. Um, you know, again, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and I really think that we just need to, you know, come together, be patient, and work together, especially to, to address that, especially what happens in the mid, uh, long-term future. Thanks. So let me just uh, say a few things about this. Uh, so first, um, there, there's an awful lot of uh, influence uh, going on in Sacramento through the legislature, through the governor's office. Uh, my world is, is isolated to oil and gas and geothermal, right? So um, we, we work in that space. And I'll tell you where, where, our, where our direction is going. And again, it goes back to the fundamentals of the renewal plan from a couple of years ago is a mandate to be data science and engineering driven in all of our decisions. So when you, when you put the data together and you put sound science and engineering uh, as a foundation for, for how you describe phenomena, for how you talk about regulations, for how you talk about operations, um, the ideal case is that we will all look at the same information and come to the same conclusion because it, it describes itself. So trying to take ambiguity and agendas out of, out of the, the equation is, is our goal. And this is part, this is a, a, the foundation of why we've done what we've done. Uh, it, it's certainly here in, in Dogger, in, in Bakersfield, and statewide, is, is to really change our foundation from one uh, historically where it's been to one which is really emphasizing data science and engineering as a foundation for everything that we do. So it becomes defensible in, in, every, in every conversation you can have. And we've found 
certainly since we've implemented those things, that uh, our dialogue with, with industry, uh, with, with other third parties, has been more, much more productive so we can work from a common foundation of, of data and science and engineering. I agree with that wholeheartedly, that information, science uh, are incredibly important in having discussions with anyone, uh, whether it's regulators, third parties, uh, company to company, et cetera, starting in uh, you know, the facts, if you can establish a base set of facts around a discussion or a decision, that can really help drive you to a common common outcome, a win-win scenario uh, for for everyone. Uh, is, is if you can start in good science, let's establish what the science of the issue is or the facts around the issue, that can really help you get to a common uh, commonality a lot quicker. Yeah, I'll tell you what we've done at California Resources, and it was uh, prior to the spinoff, I actually spent some time with um, Willie Brown in San Francisco. He was, uh, most of you know who Willie Brown is, but he's someone, even in his 80s, is probably in touch with what's going on in California politics as anyone. And he told me the big problem with your industry is you have been a punching bag and been react, not just reactive to everything forever. You just stood there and let people beat you up, and you, and you assume because you're full of engineers and scientists that the facts will win out. But, you know, as he told me, when, when it becomes a political issue, facts don't matter anymore. So I, I, I think from my, our perspective, we're trying to be much more proactive, get more engaged, um, talk about what we do as an industry and what we don't do as an industry, you know. So to, to make sure people understand uh, and get beyond, you know, fear mongering and the kind of things and the importance that our industry plays in, the, in your daily lives, in everything you do. And it, again, it's not just the transportation fuel. So I know as, as California Resources, it was something that was very important to me and very passionate to get out there and be proactive. Part of it we have out, outside the Magic Barrel, uh, Ray Clanton and, and some of our employees have done this on their own. Um, it's to, to be instructive and show people what really goes on in our industry. And I think it's important for people to understand every industry, particularly the communities you live and work in, uh, you know, what, what, you, what do you do and what don't you do? And I, I think that that's something we've done as a company a little different to try to, to, try to change it long term. To, to Suzanne's point, you're not going to change it overnight. Uh, the, the goal is really to change the long-term views and get people to have a practical, real discussion about the energy needs and how they're escalating, where we're going to get our energy from, and, and do it in a cost-effective way. I know we have some utilities in here, but to be honest, they, they don't care how much it costs, okay? You know, I told you early on, we're one of the top, you know, paying energy consumers in the country on, you know, so they get to just turn around and charge you. It's called rate base, okay? Uh, I've seen rate-based mentality firsthand in all kinds of utilities around the country. They love to pass on, you know, cost plus to you. So it really is you have to have an honest discussion about energy poverty, what it does to people. Um, you know, people in Malibu and in San Francisco don't care. They don't have to turn their air conditioners on this summer. But people in the San Joaquin Valley do. People in the Inland Empire do. So when you keep jacking up rates, you, you have to think about cost effectiveness and how it affects the humans involved here and how we you know, might cause homelessness and other things. So I think it's very important we have an honest discussion about what these things do and the policies do as you, as you roll through costs in the system because we've got to remember the utilities at the end of the day just get to pass them on to you, you know, when, you want to, when you want to turn on the light switch. So I, I think it's really important as we, as we talk about this. Um, what do you think the energy future in Kern County looks like 5, 10, 15 years? I think Clearly, as a state, we're going to hopefully be more self-sufficient as we have more renewables that can fill the, the, the middle of the day up, you know, when you talk about solar and the like. Um, but when you start looking at the increased energy usage and the need to have oil and gas long term for all the reasons we talked about, what do you think it looks like here in, in Kern County? I'll start, start with you, Don. Well, I, I think you're going to see uh, more renewables with the... Uh, the mandates coming out of uh, Sacramento uh, is number one. I think you're just going you're just going to see more of that, um, more renewables in Kern County. Uh, a, because it's a great resource for both wind and solar uh, from a geographic perspective. So that's exciting. Um, is the best wind part? Is that over the attached piece because of the elevation yeah. change in the, the high desert? The elevation change in, in the high desert. There's also a, a climate phenomenon that occurs there where. Uh, the, the heat from the desert and the coolness of the ocean basically create natural wind 
uh, that occurs uh, at the later in the day versus when it's really needed. As you saw with the duck curve ramp from 4 to 7 to 8 to 10 p.m., the increased need for energy. Uh, it's really one of the nice things about the Tehachapi's is there's a, a lot of wind that occurs during those times, uh, which is really when it's needed. I think you're going to see more energy storage. I, I think you've just got to. With, with the wind and the solar uh, in the area, you're going to see more uh, energy storage to be able to dispatch that energy because instead of curtailing it to a loss where it just goes nowhere, curtail it into energy storage, save it, so when it's needed during later in the day or early in the morning when everyone turns on their coffee pots or later in the day when everyone comes home and turns on the nightly news, it's, it, you need to give that energy. Yeah, I like this them. hybrid plant concept with yeah. the, you have a peaker kind of natural gas plant with the uh, storage. I think that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely, and I think the answer was it look like 10 years from now. I think the question is, we don't know. I think it's a matter of uh, got to be flexible and create a base economic and regulatory environment that fosters growth. Because we think about 10 years ago, in 2007, oil was over $100 a barrel. You think about everything that was going on in 2007, the idea of 11,000 megawatts of renewable energy being in Kern County, I'm not gonna say it was a pipe dream, but it was not on the forefront of a lot of folks' mind. So let's think about, let's take it out 10 years from there. What is the energy grid gonna look like? Well, I think it's about fostering a, uh, what do you think about the Western grid, and will that be helpful or hinder what uh, we're trying to do in California and Kern a, County? That's a great question, and we could spend all day discussing a Western, a Western grid and how it is, but I think you've got to set yourself up for success. And that means uh, fostering a regulatory environment that can, when change comes on the horizon, can, can reach out and grab it. And reach out, whether it is, whether Western grid happens or not, um, California is going to need energy. And with the location of, to the Bay Area and to LA here in Kern County, it really makes it a geographical, uh, real center point for the dispatch of energy um, around the state. Now, if a Western grid happens, that's only that's great. Uh, but if it doesn't happen, then it gives you a great opportunity to move energy around. Yeah, it's particularly frustrating to me to see how the amount of electricity that's imported in the state continues to rise. Because I mean, I just look at it just like the oil and the natural gas, it's exporting jobs elsewhere. You know, I, I happen to know a certain person who put a wind farm in Wyoming to sell the electricity to DWP at a premium and made a bunch of money on it. And, and it's that kind of thing where they're selling, you know, DWP, you know, supposedly green. They, they have a whole bunch of coal-fired power that they use in, to do the same thing, which is effectively, again, exporting jobs elsewhere, which is not what we're in the business of doing, especially here in Kern County. We want to create more jobs in Kern County, ultimately. So what, what, do, you, what do you see, Bill? So, uh, as I pointed out, the, uh, the the mix going forward is going to be a mixture. is going to be dictated by by mandates from Sacramento, by incentives, and by the business climate. So, the price of oil goes up another twenty, thirty, forty dollars. Uh, that will certainly change the incentives for uh, for uh, the hydrocarbon production. But um, I think what's really interesting to me in terms of the, the oil and gas part of the business is uh, when I look back over. You know, my, my, my exposure to the business the last 35 years. Uh, innovation and technology, application of technology has been huge. Right? So I look at fields today in, in Kern County, and the people who did this are sitting in the audience, right? Took fields that were on their last legs and turned them into the highest production rates you know, they've ever had. So the use of technologies through, through uh, secondary recoveries, through short radius horizontal drilling, those kinds of things have, have put new life into, into old fields and, and, and extended the lives of these, these pro projects in ways that would never have been anticipated. So the application of, of technology will certainly be a driver for that. Um, and I, I think you take a look, practical look around, around the state um, that uh, there's going to be a need for hydrocarbons for a long time especially for transportation fuels, even if, uh, with, if we achieve the, the goal of electrification of the vehicles. And the, um, the interface between the economics, the regulatory environment, and the technology you know, will really define what that looks like. But again, I, I'm always encouraged by what I see in the innovation space by, by oil and gas companies to, to be able to do both put, breathe new life in, into old fields, and, and especially you know, in, in the last couple of years, um, working with them to do that in ways which is, which is consistent with both uh, existing and anticipated regulatory, regulatory mandates. So uh, there's, there's a pathway through all of this which is compatible with, 
with, with all the goals. And, and that I think that that will define the future. So I, I don't see hydrocarbons going away by any means, and especially if price goes up and, and innovation and creativity continues on the path. You know, I, I think you'll probably see a strong oil and gas community. Um, with, well, with particularly because I, I saw, read something that talked about the new flexible cell phone screens, which is made yeah. out of the basic component is natural gas. Yes. So uh, I think if that comes to fruition, there'll there'll be a, you know, may, may, maybe the Marcellus and Haynesville will work again. Who knows? But um, it'll be <laughs> in natural gas prices will go up because of the, the cell phone boom beyond yeah. that. But yeah, it, it's so funny because people, again, only think of hydrocarbons in the sense of a transportation fuel. They don't think about the utilization for so many other things. So, Suzanne. Um, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, the majority of our domestic energy is, is produced in California and right here in Kern County. We are the third largest oil producing state uh, in the country. And also, according to the California Ener Energy Commission, California is also the third largest gasoline consuming market on the planet, right behind China as well as the United States as a whole. And I bring that up because um, I like facts and statistics, but if you look at the fuel consumption of today, there's 38 million people in California, and that number is forecasted to grow to 48 million by 2040. And there's estimated at about 26 million passenger vehicles and light trucks on the road today. And as I mentioned earlier, um, and Todd mentioned, 92% of California's transportation fuels are petroleum-based. There is an opportunity in the future for alternative sources of energy to become more of an increasing source uh, or share of our portfolio in the future. But um, I think you're going to see those numbers um, contribute to our energy needs at a more slower pace that sometimes is represented in the media and by other NGO groups. So I think we really need to keep it in perspective. But overall, from a regulatory and even an economic perspective, I think if you have transparency, you, you base your legislative decisions, hopefully, as well as your regulatory decisions on sound science, um, increase awareness of what our energy sectors bring to the economy from a state and local perspective, um, and also, you know, make sure that the public is, is a part of those decision processes, and I mean all of us as a public as well. Um, I think there's a really bright future um, for us all uh, in, in the market, and I think it's not, I think it's going to grow, and I think it will become more diverse, but I just want to emphasize again that we, we keep it in a, in a perspective and on a long-term approach. Um, when we look at the policies that drive the decisions in this state and our regulatory agencies. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to understand because I think everyone focuses on the national level with uh, Trump and the uh, Republican Congress, but I think we have the reverse here in California where we have you know, effectively Democratic control across all the houses in, in, in the uh, governor's house also. And what's interesting is the within the Democratic Party, just like in the Republican Party, whenever you're in power, you always fight among yourselves. You have this change where you have what I'll say moderate Democrats who are typically urban, um, Inland Empire, San Joaquin Valley. They're not the coastal Democrats who are very focused on jobs, the economy, because that's what their constituents care about. Then you have what I'll say are the coastal Democrats who are w worried about things that no one else is worried about. And, and, and it's, it's, it's really interesting because I, I had a discussion with one of the moderate Democrats who said he got in a shouting match with one of his colleagues and he, and he told them, what are you trying to do, make California Hawaii? And the guy said, well, what do you mean? And it's, you know, we'll have no industrial jobs, all we'll have is retirees, service sector jobs, and tourists. And, and that was what his thing is. He goes, what about the middle class? You know, what about those kind of jobs? And I think it's so important as we talk here today because the narrative you get from the NGOs and the media is different. They would think, oh my God, how could 
you know, the renewable energy people even sit in the same room with the oil and gas people, right? That they probably thought we'd come to blows or something. But that, if you if you believe the media, but I, I think it's important to understand that we're all being thoughtful, and we actually all utilize each other in different capacities. I know Chevron ourselves. We use we augment our our, our electricity usage with solar. I mean, it's important to understand we're all trying to do the same thing, and we view it, and I view it as something that's very patriotic. Again, affordable, reliable energy is very important for us to be a first world nation, and I think people take that for granted. And everyone in here is trying to do that, uh, basically here in Kern County, which is a thriving, you know, energy county here in the United States. And I think in California, where we have this chronic energy deficit, I, I know all of you listened to our very vibrant earnings call yesterday, but we had a great point on there. 12% of the country's population is here in California. But guess how much of the energy imports in our country come to California? 53% of the entire United States energy imports come to this state. So you think about that, you know, it's very reliant on somewhere else. But at the end of the day, you know, that's just my, you flip it, the script, you say that's jobs being exported elsewhere. That's all that is. That, that, that's all that is, whether it's electrical jobs, you know, whether you can't permit something, um, you know, new wind farm or, or doing something on the geothermal side. Um, I know Unical had that for years and, and some of these things, it was, very, it was very much struggled. So I mean, as you, as you look at going forward, what would be, each one of you, what would be the two things you would try to change to make Kern County more effective and even the state more effective um, to be able to facilitate what we're talking about energy and the future here in Kern County? First thing I would say with Kern County is, is we need to keep doing what we're doing, stick to the basics. Stick to the football season, so blocking and tackling that that got us here. Uh, you know, being able a government that you can communicate with, a government that you can work with, you can get things permitted in. Uh, the ball can move forward. I think that that basics will help us uh, going forward and help continue to grow uh, Kern County. It's worked. You know, it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Keep moving forward, in, you know, in a positive direction, and continue to develop local, uh, local talent to meet the next, uh, whatever is coming in the energy industry, uh, whether that is, you know, smart grids, smart homes. It seems like a turn on the TV. Every other commercial slot is some, uh, some new technology for a smart home. Whether it's controlling your AC, security. Uh, it seems like everybody's got their own solution for a smart home. Well, those require. Uh, and those are intellectual jobs, and those are intellectual uh, folks who need to wire up the system so you have a hybrid of an electrician with a hybrid of an instrument technician with a hybrid of good customer service, uh, you know, with computer science. So it's really a high-tech job. It's not just installing, you know, a, a wall switch. It's much more than that. So uh, I think it's really it's, it comes down to those two, those two items and then being ready to catch whatever's coming and being able to catch the next wave of however energy will develop. Well, and in going back to what we talked about at the beginning where we said only a third of Californians have a, adults have a bachelor's degree, you know, and, how, and they, they all want to achieve middle class um, lifestyle. What, what do we do? What kind of policies do we make sure from your perspective that we continue to pursue or we implement or change to facilitate that? Because I think that's something because you have people in Silicon Valley saying, let's you know, let's get rid of them all, let's have robots. And, and you know, they're kind of mute to the issues outside of Silicon Valley with, with industrial type uh, middle class jobs. Well, I think that goes, it goes back to creating an environment of, uh, of education and growth that, you know, it, it starts at the most fundamental level that, you know, and whether it's installing systems uh, for energy systems in substations or in homes, that those are great jobs and those are great jobs that are coming and yes silicon valley may create this this tech but somebody's got to install it somebody's got to do it somebody's got to market it somebody's got to develop it and those jobs are coming and you know they're here and they're coming but it takes a, a, a you know a workforce that's ready to go out and get it because you don't necessarily have to have a bachelor's degree to do that but you you've got to have the skills uh the knowledge the drive and you know good work ethic to do that which is something kern county has always had as citizens with a great work ethic and to continue to foster that and grow that will only well they had the forethought to put in the eir to try to ensure that they continue to have an economic vibrancy here in the, in the county 
So on a kind of a high-level economics perspective, um, uh, a, su a successful society depends is dependent upon a spectrum of, 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 of incomes and job skills. So the notion that we'll just have you know, a wealthy class with robots is, is it's not practical, right? So that's not going to happen. So that, that, that economic model will, will collapse quickly and realize that it's going to be dependent upon, uh, again, a broad spectrum of, of service providers and, and other kinds of workers in the economy. So I, I think that it, the market will, will mandate that, that the middle class continues to exist because without it, it won't, the economy will collapse. From, from, a, from a regular regular perspective, um, you know, we we represent a pretty broad uh, spectrum of stakeholders, right? and uh, statute regulations and policy are are built on on the kind of the the sum of, of all of those all of those interests. Uh, once those those policies are put in place, I think the most important thing that we do is as part of the uh, maximizing the job the job creation and and um, and, uh, and maintenance. Is, is to make our processes as objective, open, and efficient as possible. So um, bottlenecks in the system um, are, not, are not good things. Right? So how do, you, how do you get out of the way and enable things to happen or not happen, but have transparency and objectivity in what, what those policies are and how they impact uh, decisions so that business can go forward? In, in my experience, the, the big, the, the big uh, problems in, in Industry is, is is uncertainty, both in cost and in and in time. So, if you know what the costs are going to be, you can make sound business decisions based on that. If you have timelines that are reliable, you can you can do that too. So, from again from from a regular's perspective, I think that that's really our role is is to try to um, be as efficient and open and objective and transparent as we can to enable the business to to understand how they how they plan and model their path forward. Suzanne. Um, you, you mentioned the, um, and it's a great example, the Kern County um, oil and gas EIR that I think Craig Murphy even touched on a little bit earlier. Um, it's one of the most unprecedented uh, EIRs in the country, in my opinion, especially in regards to its environmental safeguards. And, and I, I bring that up and I segue into what Bill said earlier, but um, you know, the trade associations came to the county and applied to update the zoning ordinance for oil and gas. Um, but it was really the local community who came in and supported actually taking uh, a regulatory function from the state agency and bringing it to the local community for oversight. And I, and I think that's significant in, in, in many ways, and I think it ties into a lot about what we've been talking about here today in regards to helping our economy grow uh, in Kern County uh, and California, job growth and otherwise, helping the working class have a pathway to the middle class. Um, but, but also, uh, I, I think that it provided the community the opportunity to play a substantial role in, in what occurs uh, in, in our, our particular uh, energy environment. Um, on the ground, and I think you're probably going to see that more and more throughout, especially this state and maybe in other states in the near future. And I think that brings the power to the local communities uh, where the jobs need to be. Um, and there's a role that all of us can play in that. Uh, we can play in it in regards to talking to your elected officials. Um, also, I got to put a plug in, we have the Kern Citizens for Energy here in Kern County. And that's a group that is nonprofits, chamber of commerce, local businesses, uh, taxpayers, residents, and, and so forth, who want to see a ro robust and diversified um, energy industry in Kern County. And I think it makes us a very strong and powerful economy at the same time. So. Again, everybody's role, um, all the way from the legislators down to the regulatory agencies, down to the local communities, play a part, I think, in, in all of the facets that we've actually spoke about here today. Yeah, actually, I'll finish up on this, because I think it's really important. I, under our prior parent, we were basically told as employees, don't get involved, don't speak out. And I flipped that switch on, uh, with CRC. I encourage all of our employees to get involved. I try to give them the tools to be involved. And it's important because it's not just important 
for us personally, it's important for our state to be successful, our county to be successful. You have to be engaged. You have to hold the people accountable. You have to push back when there's falsehoods. And trust me, politicians respond to people showing up and talking to them and telling them, you know, you're affecting my livelihood and you're affecting your policies, your regulations, your proposals, your laws are things that are going to have a direct impact here in Kern County. And that's something I would encourage you to do, if, whether it be the local level or the state level, the federal level, get involved. Everyone incur is very uh, um, willing to listen, uh, irrespective of party, but I think it's important to get involved because trust me, if you don't, someone else will, and the NGOs and everyone else who's trying to deindustrialize our country will be there in their ears talking to them. That's why it's so important when you think about our future kind of affordable, reliable energy and, and the jobs that go with that, I think it's very important. And I want to thank Don, Bill, and Suzanne for being here today. So and thank we'll you just... very much, everyone. Appreciate it.